Hello, and welcome to Opening Bars. Open Arms is Journey's biggest U.S. billboard hit and one of the most enduring power ballads of all time. Steve Perry's incredible vocals on this track have cemented it as a memorable rock ballad for the ages. Let's look at a harmonic reduction. We're using the treble clef in the right hand and the bass clef in the left hand. There are two sharps in the key signature, so we are either in D major or B minor. The time signature is 3-4. Now, we don't see that a lot in rock music, but it doesn't mean that it should be played like a Viennese waltz. We begin with D major in root position in measure 1, followed by two first inversion triads, A major, and G major. The final three chords are all in root position, beginning on a B, A, and G. The bass line is a commonly heard descending line modeled on the scale of D major itself, ending on G, which when resolved in the beginning of the verse represents a 4-1 cadence, also known as a plagal cadence. This piece, as you may have already realized, is in a major tonality, so that's D major. The first chord can be labeled a 1, uppercase Roman numeral I for the tonic in the major, followed by a 5 chord in first inversion, so we label that a 5-6, or a V6. Now it's likely that our Western ears would naturally expect the 6 chord in the minor to be played next but Jonathan Cain provides a surprising and delightful little twist. He gives us a four chord in first inversion instead. This is my favorite chord in the sequence, as it delays my expectation and makes me wait until the next measure to get it. This is so great. We finally get the six, and then the progression moves predictably to the dominant five and to the subdominant four. It's a solid and comfortable chord sequence, with a tiny, flavorful alteration that tastes just right on our sonic palette. Now, here are all of the notes as played on the album. Let's just jump right in and play each hand separately, with a click track. It's all very straightforward if you use eighth notes as your subdivided measuring device. Here's the right hand. Be sure to use the fingering as notated on the page. Now, here's the left hand. Be wary of all the notes that are tied and use the recommended fingering. And now, let's play those together, paying close attention to how the eighth note pulse is passed between the hands and carried through the whole introduction. I do want to point out my favorite note in this whole series, and that's the E in measure 1. How beautiful is that, leaping a perfect fifth from an A to an E, all the while being underscored with an arpeggiated D major chord. This E is an appoggiatura, where the resolution note, in this case the F sharp, is delayed by having another note approach it on the beat from either above or below by a step. And as you can see, I've used fingering that supports my ability to highlight that note by using the stronger third finger instead of a four, or even worse, or pinky finger. What is even cooler is that we hear the exact same leap in measure three, but it sounds completely different, as now that E is already contained within the underlying chord of A major. That's amazing stuff. Now that you know all of the notes, you can concentrate on advancing specific piano techniques. One skill you can work on while practicing is to bring out the melody in the right hand uppermost note. 
it should be more present than the left hand throughout, and especially when playing two interval notes together in the same hand. So when I started transcribing and playing these opening bars, I noticed that I was becoming increasingly irritated with one particular chord. That chord is on beat 3 of measure 6. It just seems to come to such a jarring crunch after the lovely series of major 6ths. Then I started to notice other things that I was unhappy with, like the fingering in the left hand for measure 3 and 4, and the weird rhythm in measure 2 that doesn't appear anywhere else. So I asked myself, as a composer, what would I change or improve in this fragment? Now, it may not look that different, but there are a number of alterations present here. I wouldn't try this on a Palestrina Motet or a Beethoven Sonata, but I do think there are some improvements that may not be readily apparent to the listener, but are significant in the craft of composing. Let's look at that annoying measure 6, for instance. There are a couple of choices here. I could just remove the A in the right hand, or I could play the E in the left hand as quietly as possible, which in fact is what Jonathan actually does on the album. You can hardly hear it. And then let the sustained notes through the use of the pedal not make the dissonance as noticeable. But I've gone a step further here and changed the actual rhythm to mimic measure 1 and measure 2. This is what it sounds like. To me, that sounds better. So then we have... But wait, as you can hear, we now have another problem. It's suddenly boring. Let me explain. As a composer, Elements that I think about a lot are repetition and novelty. You see, as humans, we like both, but not too much of either. The craft of a composer is knowing how much to provide of each. Now that we have the same rhythm four times in a row, it's way too repetitive. So that means if I want to keep my measure 1 rhythm in measure 6, I'm going to have to change measure 5 and make it straight quarters. Let's try that now. But you know, we could still make it even better by giving those straight quarters some support. Perhaps they need a repetition of their own. And you can see that I've done that by highlighting the G major in the right hand, which is my favorite chord in the sequence anyway, with a descending second version triad of B, G, D. Okay, I'm satisfied with that. So now for the left hand in measure 3 and 4, perhaps we could just rearrange which hand plays which notes. And so, in doing that, I've eliminated the awkward crossover we previously had to negotiate. It also serves my measure 5 alteration quite nicely as well. And I've also added an A as a subtle voice leading addition into the B, G, D in the next measure. Now you can also see that I've altered measure 2. I'll be honest, I'm not sure if it works in the overall scheme of things, but I've mimicked the melodic motif of the right hand in the left hand. I think that if we were going to use it, it would have to be played very softly and delicately, otherwise it's too distracting and overpowering. I'm still undecided if I like it or not. And finally, you may have also noticed that I removed the G from the final chord in the right hand, as I really felt it was way too heavy and unnecessary, for the left hand is already outlining a strong G, D, G which is the fundamental in the first two overtones in its harmonic series, and the addition of the G in the right hand chord is then wholly redundant. I also changed the notes in the final measure to give it more flow. So there you have it, the new and improved, but no less sonically significant, open arms.
I hope you enjoyed your lesson today. Remember, don't just play notes. Make music. Until next time, thanks for listening.